Welcome to the Walton Pi. Today we're going to be discussing Runge's approximation theorem. So in real analysis, we have a theorem called the Weierstrass approximation theorem, which says that if f is a real valued continuous function defined on a compact set k, then that means there's going to be a polynomial p of x such that for any epsilon bigger than zero and all x in our set k, the distance between f of x and p of x is going to be less than epsilon. So Runge's approximation theorem is the complex analysis analog of this Weierstrass approximation theorem. So Runge's approximation theorem says that if we have a compact subset K of the complex numbers, then if F is a holomorphic function on an open set containing K, then F is able to be approximated uniformly on K by rational functions whose singularities are in the complement of K. So if we were to try and visualize what this means, if this weird green blob is our compact subset K, then what we can do is we can say, well, I can approximate any holomorphic function on K where I can do so using rational functions where the singularities are at these red crosses, where all of these are in the complement of K. And each of these crosses are going to be some singularity. And we are able to do this where we are able to approximate our function f uniformly with those rational functions. But then there's an additional piece to Runge's approximation theorem that says that if a is any set which contains at least one point from every bounded connected component of the complement of k, then f is able to be approximated uniformly on k by rational functions whose singularities are in our set a. So what this means is because these two points on the outside are not in a bounded component, they are in an unbounded component of the complement, we are able to make it so that the singularities are not actually there. So that means we can actually remove those singularities and only have singularities in those different connected components that are bounded as well. So that means we are able to actually do a little bit better than we had thought where we are able to have the singularities only be in those bounded connected components of the complement. Now there's an additional corollary to Runge's theorem that says that if we have the complement of K is a connected set, then that means that F can be approximated uniformly by polynomials. So if the complement is connected, that means we can't have any of these pieces on the inside, which means we only have the exterior of K. Now, because k was compact, that means k is going to be bounded, which means that this complement is always going to be unbounded, which means that all of our singularities are not going to exist. We can pick a to be the empty set because that does contain at least one point from every connected bounded component, which means that we can actually approximate it using polynomials because those are the rational functions without any singularities. Okay, so now let's go through and talk about what do these results mean. So the main conclusion of Runge's theorem is that the function f is able to be approximated uniformly on k by rational functions. So let's talk about uniform convergence of functions. Uniform convergence of functions means that if f of z is being approximated by rational functions p sub n of z, then that means that for any epsilon bigger than zero, there is going to be some n bigger than zero, such that for all little n bigger than big n, we have the absolute value of f of z minus p sub n of z is going to be less than epsilon for all z in our domain k. Now, what this means is that if we have some sort of function, so this is going to be like a real analog of this. So if we have this as our function and we have a epsilon neighborhood of that function, there's going to be a polynomial that is going to be able to fit within that epsilon neighborhood uh, for whatever epsilon we pick. And if we decrease epsilon, then maybe we need to get a different polynomial, but there will always be a polynomial that will be able to be squeezed in there. So now, let's, now that we've talked about that, let's start to set up the proof. So we're going to start by letting k be a compact set u is going to be an open set which contains k, and f is going to be a holomorphic function on u. So then what we're going to do is we're going to have gamma in u be a positively oriented piecewise linear closed loop. Okay, so a lot of words. So positively oriented, just the standard direction. It's piecewise linear, so it's going to be made up of a bunch of line segments. It's closed, so it ends where it starts, and then it's just a loop, so it ends where it starts. 
and then we are going to have k be in the interior of gamma. Okay, so then since k is compact, this loop is going to be able to be comprised of finitely many linear segments. So how do we know that it can be made up of only finitely many line segments? Well, imagine we have our set k like this. We can cover this with any sort of open cover, and then there's going to be a finite subcover. So suppose that we cover k with closed squares, so that their edges are going to be overlapping with adjacent squares. So we have this, and that means that for this, we can be able to construct from this a boundary comprised of finitely many segments, such as this boundary. And so what we can do is, if we want a tighter boundary, we just have to refine the grid by making them smaller. Now, those closed squares are not an open cover, but just take an open neighborhood of those closed squares, and that would be an open cover. Okay, so now that we have established that we can do so with a finite number of line segments, let's look at Cauchy's integral formula. So that says that f of z is going to be 1 over 2 pi i times the integral over our curve gamma of f of zeta divided by zeta minus z times d zeta. And then since gamma is comprised of linear pieces, we can rewrite that integral as a sum of integrals over linear pieces, where we are going to write those linear pieces as gamma sub n. And each of those are going to just be a linear piece of our entire loop big gamma. And now we're going to be looking at these linear pieces individually. If we let gamma of t be a parameterization of gamma defined for t in the interval from 0 to 1, then the integral over gamma sub n of f of zeta divided by zeta minus z d zeta, that's going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of f of gamma of t divided by gamma of t minus z times gamma prime of t dt. Note that the only singularities in the integral are going to be occurring on gamma, which never intersects the compact set k. This means that our function is going to be continuous on k cross the interval from 0 to 1 in z and t. Therefore, if we fix a z in our set k, our function is going to be uniformly continuous in t, since the function is continuous on a compact set, in this case, the set from 0 to 1. Now, let's remind ourselves what does it mean for a function to be uniformly continuous. Well, the function f is uniformly continuous if for any epsilon bigger than 0, there is a delta bigger than 0, such that whenever the distance between t1 and t2 is less than delta, then the distance between f of t1 and f of t2 is less than epsilon. This is different than just continuous at a point, since the definition of f being continuous at the point t is that for any epsilon bigger than 0, there is a delta bigger than 0, such that whenever the distance between t and t2 is less than delta, then the distance between f of t and f of t2 is less than epsilon. This second definition is a weaker condition, since here the value of delta is allowed to depend upon the value of t that we are looking at, whereas in uniform continuity, that is the same delta value everywhere. We're now going to show that each of these linear pieces are uniformly approximated by rational functions. So let's define f of zt and f sub n of z by f of zt equaling f of gamma of t divided by gamma of t minus z times gamma prime of t, and f sub n of z to be 1 over n times the sum from k equals 1 to n of f of z and k over n in, this, in the t spot. We know that each of the f sub n's are going to be holomorphic on k since all of the singularities are outside of k. We will now show that the f sub n's converge uniformly to the integral from 0 to 1 of f of gamma of t divided by gamma of t minus z gamma prime of t dt. So we know that f of z t is uniformly continuous in t. That means that for any epsilon bigger than 0, there will be a delta bigger than 0, such that whenever the distance between t1 and t2 is less than delta, then the distance between f of z and t1 and f of z and t2 that is going to be less than epsilon. So we are going to just let n be bigger than 1 over delta. Then the absolute value of f sub n of z minus the integral from 0 to 1 of f of gamma of t divided by gamma of t minus z gamma prime of t dt, well what we can do is we can replace the f sub n of z with its definition and we can break that integral up into n segments so that we can be able to compare the two pieces together. 
So that is what we have here. We are able to rewrite that as being equal to the sum from k equals 1 to n of the integrals of those segments of length 1 over n of f of z comma k over n minus f of z comma s ds. Now notice that we can move the absolute values all the way in through the sum and the integral at the cost of a less than or equal to. So what we're going to do is we move those uh, absolute values in and then that distance is at most epsilon and the length of the interval that we are integrating over is 1 over n. So that means each of those are going to be less than or equal to epsilon over n's and we are adding up n of them so that's how we're going to be getting our epsilon. So that means that we have this being less than epsilon. Therefore, the integral from 0 to 1 of f of gamma of t divided by gamma of t minus z times gamma prime of t dt will be approximated uniformly by the f sub n of z's, which are the 1 over n times the sum from k equals 1 to n of f of z comma k over n. Note that each of these f sub n of z's are rational functions in z, since f of z comma t is equal to f of gamma of t divided by gamma of t minus z gamma prime of t, the only spot where there's a z is in that denominator. So that means that we have a rational function in z since the, all the stuff with t's don't depend upon z at all. Therefore, the integral is going to be approximated uniformly by rational functions in z, which means that each linear term in f of z equaling 1 over 2 pi i, the integral over gamma, of f of zeta divided by zeta minus z that's equal to the sum over those linear segments, which is able to be approximated uniformly by rational functions. Therefore, our function f of z is uniformly approximated by a sum of rational functions. And since a sum of rational functions is also a rational function, our function f of z is uniformly approximated by a rational function. Therefore, we have proven the first part of Runge's approximation theorem. In order to prove the second one, we're going to have to do a little bit more work. Now, the work that we're going to need to do is going to rely on the following fact. Let's let w be a point on the line gamma, and w prime is going to be a point also not in k and is in the same component of the complement of k. Without loss of generality, we can assume that the line that connects w to w prime is contained in that same component of the complement of k. Um, meaning that the line never exits that specific component. And the reason we can do that is because if it didn't, we could just have a piecewise linear path connecting the two, and then it's going to be the same argument on each of those line segment pieces. So that means we can write 1 over z minus w to be 1 over z minus w prime times 1 over 1 minus w minus w prime all over z minus w prime. That's just a weird way of factoring it, and this is going to be something that we can rewrite it as. But notice that that 1 over 1 minus stuff can be rewritten as a series. So once we rewrite it as a series, we see that it's 1 over z minus w prime times the sum of w minus w prime to the n divided by z minus w prime to the n, which we can combine together to be just the sum from n equals 0 to infinity of w minus w prime to the n divided by z minus w prime to the n plus 1, which is going to converge uniformly to 1 over z minus w. So that means that as long as our set A contains at least one point in each connected component of the complement of k, then f can be approximated uniformly on k by rational functions whose singularities are in A. And the reason for that is because we can just take our nth partial sum of this series, and that's going to be within epsilon of it if we have a small enough epsilon and a large enough n. So that means that we are going to be able to approximating f uniformly by rational functions whose singularities are in A. And if we have any singularities in our unbounded component, using the same logic we can push those singularities out towards infinity. We just send them to a point further from the origin and then repeat that process over and over and over so that we are able to push those singularities all the way out to infinity. So if we were to look at that, we'd take this point that was close, send it to a point further away, and then that's going to be a new rational function we can do, and we can just keep sending that singularity further and further out, out towards infinity. So that means we have been able to successfully prove all parts of Runge's approximation theorem. So we have our complex analysis version of the Weierstrass approximation theorem. 
So if we have a compact subset of the complex numbers, if f is a holomorphic function on an open set that contains that compact set, then f can be approximated uniformly on the compact set by rational functions whose singularities are in the complement of k. And we can even go a little bit better than that and say that if a is any set which contains at least one point from each bounded connected component of the complement of k, then f can be approximated uniformly on k by rational functions whose singularities are in a. And that set A, that is an arbitrary set. We are able to pick exactly where we want those singularities as long as we have picked at least one point from every single bounded component. I hope this video was helpful in understanding Runge's approximation theorem. I thought it was pretty cool, and so I'm very glad to be able to share it with all of you. I hope you have a great rest of your day, and good luck with all of your math.